Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you do you struggle with concentration have you ever thought of your brain health long term bomar nutrition is revolutionizing the nootropic and cognitive health industry with sharp nootropic powder and patent pending bright daily capsules powered by neurobloom if you struggle with focusing think of sharp as brain food that supports concentration Sharp works with your natural brain chemistry to provide a heightened sense of well-being that can delay cognitive decline and also increase mood. Bomar Sharp tastes amazing and comes in many different flavors, available in caffeinated and non-caffeinated versions. While Sharp is a short-term aid in cognitive health, think of Bright Daily Capsules as a way to improve overall brain health and prevent cognitive decline long-term. As we age, so does our brain. Supplementing with Bright has the potential to delay this aging process and helps your brain function optimally. Stay ahead of the curve and order yours today at BomarNutrition.com and save $5 off with code GENIUS5. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we continue... I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Elvir Kosovich, Esquire and PhD. So he's an entrepreneur, professor, uh, has a legal degree. And we're going to talk about his work with medical devices and uh, his interactions with Wall Street and perhaps venture capital, et cetera. So, Elvira, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Richard, for the opportunity. Yeah, you have a pretty diverse background. So when I speak with people like you, I guess polymaths in a sense, um, what, what would you like to focus on in the interview? What's most important for you to discuss right now? You know, whatever it is that your, uh, that your audience w- w- would find most interesting. Uh, but my, my focus area right now is in converting wisdom teachings from time immemorial into uh, usable wisdom skills today and then looking for areas where there's an overlap between wisdom teachings from many different religions and traditions and, uh, and societies and the overlap of that with the latest scientific findings that we have with you know, mm. fancy equipment that we have and fancy research that people do. Well, I guess, if you don't mind, what I'm seeing is that there's just tremendous uncertainty, you know, with the whole COVID thing. And now with, you know, the Ukraine issue, et cetera, I'm feeling like the future is incredibly uncertain. I'm sure everyone else is. And I'm seeing that uh, anxiety levels amongst everyone I speak to, young and old, unfortunately, even more young, are way up there. So, you know, wisdom from any age, I'm sure will be very useful. So what, um, I mean, tell me some of your background and then uh, how can we apply the stuff you've learned to what's going on today for people? Sure. I trained as an engineer originally at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and then uh, for my doctoral dissertation, 
I worked on the brain. So I, I figured out how to measure uh, some signals from the very center of the brain, from the brain stem, from kind of the bottom of the brain. And the first application was in testing uh, hearing for babies at birth, whether or not they can hear, whether or not their brains are functioning correctly. From there, I went on, uh, went on to Yale to, uh, to teach. I was a professor for a few years. And then I started uh, what ended up being a series of medical device companies that, that basically looked at various ways to measure uh, brain activity levels. And then to figure out, you know, first for babies, the next product and the next company was to measure brain waves for anesthesia. So if you go and get surgery and you, you get some anesthesia, you know, do you have enough or do you have too much? Or the anesthetic, you know, or do you have the just the right amount? And then the last medical device company was basically started to help the, the warriors coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and then it branched out into NCAA and NFL uh, for concussion. So we built a device that measures, you know, with a simple, you know, think of it like almost like a big Band-Aid that goes on your forehead, can measure whether somebody has a concussion or not, and if they do, how serious right. it is. Yeah, these are all great things. Um... These are more like, I guess, you know, solutions to existing problems out there. Um, but you did mention wisdom. So how are you dividing your time nowadays? Is it, is it all towards like innovation and engineering and problem solving? Or is it more of like a counseling, you know, elder guidance role for young engineers and other people? Sure. So it's, it's really more working with people in, from all walks of life. And, you know, the connection between wisdom and the work that I did with the brain is, you know, what, as I studied consciousness and try to figure out kind of how the brain works, I learned some important things that basically how our brains work and, and why they work that way. But then as I started reading more and more and trying to figure out, well, how do we figure this out? And how do we know this? And where did this come from? And where do we check this? Uh, you know, you very quickly you get to the ancient Greeks. And then uh, when you start reading deeper, you, you get to the uh, basically the indigenous people in various cultures. And what was amazing to me is the amount of overlap that, in, that's applicable to anxiety and stress today, like you talked about, uh, you know, what we're finding in latest science, how our brain works, and also what we learn from, you know, the Buddhist tradition or, you know, you know Confucius or, you know, the earliest humans and earliest, you know, earliest organized uh, human dwellings and settlements uh, in uh, in Africa and Aboriginals in Australia and all over the world. But again, what what practical advice do you have, and for what reason for people today? Are you focused on helping people with anxiety, or what is your focus? And then you know we can bring in the wisdom you've learned from everything. Sure. So the focus is uh, right now. I run an organization called Upend Upend dot com, and it's a new school of living wisdoms, and it's it's basically set up to work with regular people from all walks of life to teach them uh, wisdom skills. So one, for example, one wisdom skill is mindfulness, right? How, how do you be mindful? And it's, you know, that wisdom skill can be very helpful with anxiety and stress is, is to really, for example, we have this thing I call it the pact, make a pact with yourself or make a pact uh, for your well-being. And it's, it's P-A-C-T, pact, uh, like make an agreement or make a pact with yourself. And the four parts are uh, the pause, uh, ask, choose, and then tackle, like take some action. And, you know, these are, these are simplified summaries. Uh, but the first idea is when you find yourself in a situation of stress or anxiety is, is number one, just pause, right? Just pause, take a breath. Nothing's going to happen. And it literally just takes a few seconds. And, and neuroscience tells us uh, that's also how our brains work, right? Our brains are pre-wired and go on automatic. So if we take action, like immediately after some trigger happens, right, some trigger like our boss says something mean or our child is, you know, uh, not listening or our spouse, you know, snaps at us or snaps back at us. Now, if we allow ourselves to react automatically, we actually create more trouble. So the first part is just pause and figure out what's really going on uh, here. The second part to ask is um, ask what 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 is really going on in this situation and, and uh, what action for me would make uh, the most sense? Ask, like, what are the options available to me, right? So one option is to yell back at your child or, you know, to snap back at your boss or, you know, to argue with your spouse. Uh, but really in asking, you're saying, what other options are available to me? What else could I do? What is And what's really going on? Is my child acting out because they're hungry or tired, right? Is my spouse 
you know, really upset about me, whatever, you know, not clearing the dishes, or, or is he or she really upset that, you know, I'm just not, you know, doing, you know, carrying my fair share around the house. Like, ask, ask some questions about the situation, but you can't do that if you skip the, the pause part. And then the choose is, yeah. you know, choose your action, right? What, what, what's the right thing to do here? What kind of stance should I adopt, right? Should I adopt the warrior stance and, and fight here? Should I adopt the lover stance and, and be kind and gentle? You know, should I adopt a, kind of a mystic or a shaman or, or a spiritual uh, stance and figure out is there something else that's going on here that's not immediately obvious? Or should I, you know, maybe the right thing to do is to adopt a light heart stance. And all of these four ways of being are something that's taught in ancient uh, in, you know, in ancient cultures across the world, you know, is this something, is this an opportunity to make a joke at my own expense, right? So if my wife says, you know, why didn't you clean the dishes? Should I say, well, I didn't do the laundry either, uh, like that, and kind of turn the whole situation around. It just depends on what, you know, what the context is. And if your brain is an automatic, it can't really, it can't really, uh, you don't give yourself time to generate options and then to choose the best option that will, that will be greatest for, uh, for everybody in that situation. Yeah. I would think that things that would get in the way of this is the pressure of not responding immediately. And maybe the other person is says, hello, hello, I just said something to you and tries to get you off kilter and respond immediately. Or, you know, your own ego, you just want to snap with a comeback that kind of protects your own ego. But if you pause, I don't know, maybe uh, one would feel like they're, they're now on the defensive or they're now all eyes are on them and they have to, perform even more than they would if they just snapped and reacted. That's right. So the, the ancient wisdom skill of courage comes in, uh, right? And, and, and you need to have the courage to pause, to just have a moment of silence. Now, you also should, should be a wise warrior and, and communicate. So if you just pause weirdly for 30 seconds in the middle of, you know, of an argument, that's just weird, right? That's the, like you could actually upset the person, make things worse. So the pausing is really just so that you're not completely on automatic. You pause for just, it's enough to have one or two breaths. Um, it turns out in neuroscience, we know that, you know, kind of the automatic parts of our brain react in 30 thousandths of a second. So it's, it were that quick. Uh, and it just takes about, you know, even less than a full second for the information, whatever the trigger is, to actually reach the front of our brain when we can actually think. And that's what we're trying to do is to, to, to engage our brain and then if you study further in neuroscience, you see that our, you know, complete nervous system uh, is, is uh, it takes a little bit more time uh, to, you know, for, for us to actually react to something. So the smart thing to do is just wait one, two, three seconds, get input from other parts of our body, right? What is our gut saying, right? What is, uh, what is our heart saying? What, is, uh, what, what are the other inputs that are available? Because it's one of the things I learned about the brain is, it's not all about the brain. A lot of other parts of the body participate in decision making, and and we've been trained in our current educational system is the brain is it end all and be all. Uh, and oftentimes it's like ancient wisdoms teach us. Uh, it's about consulting with the heart and consulting with our gut. How many times do you say I had a gut feeling about this, but you still did something different? Yeah, if I don't trust my gut, you know, I usually get into trouble. And sometimes, like I said, I react right away. Sometimes it. You know, a lot of times, I don't know, I'll have a conversation with someone and, I don't know, sometimes I'll be on my game and I'll react right away. Sometimes I'll be able to wait and then react. A lot of times, you know, I'll come away from the conversation and say, damn it, I should have said this, you know. So it, it happens in, like, uh, I guess, different, different parts of the conversation. Um, one thing I've noticed is sometimes when I speak to someone and if it's getting adversarial, I picture a dial on the wall. And I can say, hmm, should I turn it up or turn it down? And usually I turn things down. Sometimes I say, ah, the heck with it, and I turn it up. But it's also tiring to um, – I, I know this gives you more of a measure of control, but it also feels like tiring. Like, why don't I always have to be the one in control? Why can't the other person do that for me? Because those are all the feelings that, that come with it. No, you're exactly right. And this is the last piece of making a pact with yourself, is once you choose uh, your course of action – Sometimes uh, people will choose and say, okay, I, you know, I have this spat with my, you know, with my spouse uh, and he or she said something to me and I know I can be loving here or I can be terse on the way back or, you know, and snap back. I can, I, I have all of these uh, options. I choose to be nice, but then I don't follow through. 
right? So that's the tackle piece is actually the most important piece. And this is how your brain relearns. Um, many people have heard about brain plasticity and, you know, what does that really mean? It means that, uh, the, you know, your literal, the makeup of your brain over time with practice can change. Not completely, but enough, uh, certainly at this level of how you're reacting to somebody, how you're dealing with your own anxiety and your own stress, and are you actually creating more stress and anxiety in your life, uh, or are you helping bring the stress and anxiety that's around you, are you helping bring it, you know, into something that's, uh, that's more loving? And what's so amazing about this brain plasticity is you can read 100 books about it, you can, you know, journal about it, you can, you can think really hard about it, but nothing replaces uh, your brain learning uh, when, you know, you're, you know, whatever, you're debating with your boss or you're debating with your spouse or, or even somebody at the store, right? Somebody's mean to you. And if you're mean back to them, your brain learns that, okay, this is conflict and I know how to do this. But if you're kind, for example, if you choose kindness and you actually do it, despite the fact that your body is all tense and you choose kindness and you tackle the actual problem that's going on, and, and, and you follow through, you have the courage to follow through, then you see the other person respond with kindness back. And it's that feedback loop in your brain that helps rewire the brain. And then next time, when you know the automatic response will be kindness, not snappiness, as an example. And then over time, you'll see that your anxiety starts dropping, your stress level starts dropping. I mean, think about it this way. You know, sometimes you're in a good mood and everything is going well and all of this and somebody cuts you off at the stoplight. You're like, ah, whatever. Uh, other times you had a tough morning, you know, get the kids to school, do this, do that, go to work, late for a meeting. Exact same scenario. Somebody cuts you off at that same stoplight. Now all of a sudden you're, you know, a raging bowl of, of, of anger. So some of it has to do with you also, even though the situation is exactly the same, it's how you came to it. And, and that's another yeah. part about managing stress and anxiety is, you know, what can I do in my offline, you know, when I'm not in the middle of a stressful situation? And, and that's rest, right, and, and peace. And number one advice, uh, be in nature, right? If you look at the indigenous people today, one of the strong messages that I'm hearing is that we've lost our connection to nature. And, and nature teaches us uh, this kind of and, and calms us, actually physically calms down our nervous system. And, and calms our brain down, just spending time in nature. Yeah, I know um, sometimes something will happen in a day and it makes me mad. And, you know, I know that I shouldn't have certain conversations because I, you know, I'm not going to be my best. So sometimes I can, I'm mad, I don't know why. And usually when I figure it out, oh, I, oh, this person, you know, earlier, that's why I'm mad. It helps a little bit. It takes the edge off. It doesn't always get rid of the whole thing, but at least it's like an explanation, which helps a bit. That's right. If we set ourselves a goal to be wise, we all know what it means to be wise. Right? We all have examples of wise people in our life. And if that's something that's just in front of our mind and say, okay, what would be a wise uh, response right now? Maybe the right thing to do right now is just to walk away. Or maybe to just ask your spouse or your boss and say, hey, look, can we talk about this tomorrow? Or maybe it's to address it right then and there, right? If somebody slights you, you know, at, at work and it's the third time, Maybe it's time to say, hey, stop, you know, I'm, this is the third time I'm being interrupted here in this meeting, just let me finish my thought uh, in a kind, professional way, rather than letting it go. The difference in knowing what to do comes from asking, asking yourself what's really going on in this situation, and then again, you're back to the pack. You pause, you ask, you choose your response, and then you follow through. Key thing is that last piece is to follow through, rather than saying, oh, I should have said something. Then, then just say it. Just have the courage to, uh, to say it, but keep to your core values, right? What are your values? To be kind, to be gentle, to be loving, to be successful, like that. But it's no, uh, very few people have their core values to be snappy and irritable. Yeah, and I realized, you know, that old saying, hurt people hurt people. You know, I realized that. I've seen it. But, you know, sometimes, uh, I don't know, I guess it's, it's hard to keep, keep on an even keel, especially if you're faced with, let's say, a lot of difficult conversations or a particularly difficult one that's coming up, you know. What can people do, again, in the off times where they're not in the middle of, of speaking to someone and, you know, maybe an adversarial conversation? Like, what can they do to prepare for one? What can they do in the off times to help themselves? You know, think about your nervous system, like your nerves that go out from, from your brain, you know, into your hands and, and, and your legs, right? This nervous system kind of goes two ways, right? It, it, it sends information out that brings information back in. and this nervous system, as you rev it up, it can only take so much, 
so being you know being in a in a quiet space uh being with a friend uh being in nature all of these things calm you down being in a in, in traffic you know being you know having a busy morning stacking your meetings back to back all of these things rev up uh, your nervous system so if you're going into an important meeting you're going for an important interview you're going to have you know you're walking into a difficult discussion with your spouse or your kids it's a really good idea to time those conversations that when you're kind of at your best and to give yourself some time to prepare for those oftentimes we think we can just discharge a difficult conversation just we have this false idea that that we're invincible and and we're not that dial that you mentioned that's on the wall imagine if if you start at zero in the morning and it's a stress dial and then you know the you know getting out of the house you're already at a two you know, driving to work in traffic, you're at a five, you know, uh, all, you know, a six, seven, eight, and then you're walking into an important meeting with your boss, you already revved up. The odds of you saying or doing something that you're going to later regret are really high. So perhaps for your lunch break, take a walk, go to the park, listen to your favorite song, like bring your nervous system, bring your system down so that, uh, so that you're prepared. Maybe jot a few notes. Uh, like that it's it's this is the reflection part that's taught in every religion and you know every every wisdom tradition is is reflection and that mindfulness that that you know the quiet time the peace time that that we all need and why do we do it it has the exact correlate in neuroscience we can measure these electrical waves from the nervous system and from our brain and we can tell you when you're meditating your brain looks a certain way when you're normal, the brain looks a different way, and you're, if you're totally stressed out, your brain looks completely different. Uh, the brain electrical waves, for example, right? It's the, the, the noise is, is almost apparent uh, with the naked eye. And so we have these teachings. All we got to do is, is listen to them, right? The, the, you know, thank you for giving voice to the wisdom on, uh, on uh, your podcast and others. And I encourage uh, the folks who are working with you and, and are listening to this to ask themselves, what is it that I already know about wisdom? I'll learn later. You can always learn more and more and more. But what do I know right now today that will be a wise thing to do? And then let me just start something, right? Again, that in the pact, that last piece, T, the tackle, just do one of those things, right? Just just actually go and, and execute it. Have the courage to go take a walk. Have the courage to exercise. Have the, 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 uh, the courage to postpone some conversation until it's a better time like that and then and then prepare for that so just my ask of people is use the wisdom skills you already have and then when you start seeing that they're working you said in the beginning of the uh, of the call sometimes i don't trust my gut feeling that's exactly it it's about learning to trust your heart and your gut and your brain and that only comes with a little bit of practice so don't practice immediately with your most important job interview of your life but practice with your kids with your spouse with your friends and then you'll start trusting more and more that guidance from your gut and from your heart. And slowly, slowly, this is how you bring wisdom into your life. And it works. It really works beautifully. It changes people's lives. Do you struggle with concentration? Have you ever thought of your brain health long term? Bomar Nutrition is revolutionizing the nootropic and cognitive health industry with sharp nootropic powder and patent pending bright daily capsules powered by NeuroBloom. If you struggle with focusing, think of sharp as brain food that supports concentration. Sharp works with your natural brain chemistry to provide a heightened sense of well-being that can delay cognitive decline and also increase mood. Bomar Sharp tastes amazing and comes in many different flavors, available in caffeinated and non-caffeinated versions. While Sharp is a short-term aid in cognitive health, think of Bright Daily Capsules as a way to improve overall brain health and prevent cognitive decline long-term. As we age, so does our brain. Supplementing with Bright has the potential to delay this aging process and helps your brain function optimally. Stay ahead of the curve and order yours today at bomarnutrition.com and save $5 off with code GENIUS5. Well, have you done this on yourself first or are there people that you've counseled to do it? And what have you noticed along the way? Both. You know, I'm Bosnian and we're known for being extremely hard-headed. So for me, the lessons took, you know, a long time. And one thing you learn about the universe it, it presents you lessons until you've learned them. So if something is repeating in your life, it just means you haven't learned it yet. And, you know, you should start thinking about how to learn it. So absolutely, I applied it to myself. And it's just brought peace. I have four kids. You know, I've had a number of careers. I, I've built and sold companies. The, the amount of stress and, and the kind of existential anxiety and, and all of that that I had in my prior companies versus today, 
the kind of people I attract to myself. Um, I'm just having fun. And it has nothing to do with money. I'm, you know, I, there have been periods where I've had more money and less money, where companies were successful or when they failed. It has nothing to do with that. There's been periods when family situation was difficult or when it was easy. It, it, it really has more to do with um, just figuring out kind of how life works. And we don't have to figure out on our own. All we got to do is look back you know, in, into, our, uh, in, into our spiritual traditions, into our religious traditions, into our cultural traditions, and you know, look at the indigenous people, look at the earth-based people, and start applying in real life uh, some of these lessons, one step at a time. Reciprocity, courage, awareness, mindfulness, uh, abundance, uh, like that. And think of them as skills that you need to learn, and just pick one at a time. Gratitude is a perfect example. You know, do you have a gra skill for gratitude? Do you know how to be thankful for the things that, you know, around you and people around you and, and thankful for your health and your body and, uh, and, er and, everything, uh, and everything you have? And then uh, do you have a gratitude practice, uh, for example? So once you start picking off one of these wisdom skills at a time and you start developing them, they really work. And, and, and then you can teach them, right? You can slowly, slowly, I brought my spouse into, into this and my kids. Our conversations are very different today than they were just even you know a year ago. Oh, how so? What do you mean? When tensions when when tensions flare up, what I used to do is is add to the mix of of flaring up and you know show the other person where I was right or wrong. Just learning one skill of listening uh, has been tremendous. It just just let the person say it's not going to hurt you to let them finish their entire thought. And when they're done and they stop talking, they feel satisfied. They feel content that they've been heard. For example, simple wisdom skills, listening, right, under, under the rubric of listening. And, you know, that's one. And then I teach my kids. And when I start talking back and they, they interrupt me, I say, listen, I, I just listened to you for 30 minutes. Just hear me out here. There's a point. I'm getting to a point. Just a few things like that. Uh, and and, and there, there, there are things you can teach yourself first and then those around you. And with your, with your you know, partner, with people at work. Uh, be a leader in your life to bring wisdom into your own personal life and then into the lives of people around you. And this has nothing to do with fancy, you know, Aristotle or Socrates or anything like that. Just keep it very simple, no $10 words. Keep it very down to earth, simple things, right? The, you know, the, the courage and the listening and the gratitude and mindfulness and all of these things are simple daily things we can all do. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have a formal program where you teach people this? Yes. And how long uh, did it take you to, to get, get there? So it took, you know, on and off uh, with the teachers that, I, that I'm working now. We have uh, eight really wonderful elders and teachers uh, from all walks of life and, you know, different, you know, religious and spiritual backgrounds and atheists and, and you know, different persuasions in life. And we've put together this course we call The Opening, and it's taught through Upend. It's really nice. It goes on Zoom. It's three weekends basically spread out by month apart, so it's over three months. Uh, and that's exactly what we do. We teach wisdom skills, and these teachers deliver these things that I talked about one at a time in a very easy to understand way. And then we have coaches that work with people uh, for you know for during you know the ninety days where you get to practice these skills with the person who's trained. So you say you want to work on your you know abundance skills or your reciprocity or your courage or your you know respect or gratitude uh, boundaries. You pick whichever ones you want to work on. Uh, we deliver kind of the lectures and, and we do fun games and learn through experience. And then you get to practice with your coach one-on-one -on -one and communicate with your peers. Uh, we've designed it such that these things can be easily learned. And we, we uh, again, keep it very simple, very easy going for busy people who have real lives and kids and jobs. How have you seen, I mean, do you have, I guess you would have both men and women in your program. Um, who does it tend to attract, like? Men or women, older people, younger people, certain circumstances. Yeah, it's it's pretty evenly split. Uh, we were very happy to see that that you know the teachers are that way as well and coaches. So it's a really good mix, and that's another thing you learn from ancient wisdoms. It's it's a circle of people. It's a council. Not any one person has the wisdom. You know, we don't really do like the guru thing, right? That's that's not something. Uh, that's not something we do. What you know, the idea is that the wisdom is held by the community, and then there are some elders who've just been around longer and who spent more time uh, addressing, you know, wisdom. And then elders has nothing to do with age. You can have an elder that's 20 years old and you can have somebody who is in their later years in life and still don't have some things figured out. So it helps to have elders uh, to teach wisdom. It helps to have peers 
Uh, and then, you know, we learn a lot from, from the people who sign up. You know, people will bring either a good question or some experience that, you know, that, that, that's really meaningful to them or some learning that they have or something from their own tradition that they share. What are some of the sticking points you see people have as they're going through the program? Probably that there's a lot of material. And, you know, we, we made the program 90 days because neuroscience teaches us that's how long it takes to form a habit, you know, to, to turn something into a practice. And uh, so what we've done, you know, with every class, we learn so much with feedback and everything else. We really simplified it and kind of honed it down to say, look, we're not going to do everything. We're going to we're going to focus on the important things that uh, that, that, you know, that people need and get some clarity about their, you know, their their own purpose in life and their own gift and their own task and, you know, how they interact with their family and, and, and stay focused on these, you know, the basic skills uh, of, you know, of empathy, of, of awareness, uh, of humor, uh, things like that. Okay. Are there certain people that have more problems with the program or they just find it more difficult than others or does everyone seem to get through it pretty well? I mean, like, what have you observed that surprised you about it? You know, you had your intentions with the program, but now that X number of people have gone through it, is it any different than you expected? Sure. What I didn't expect is so much diversity. And I'm thrilled about it, but I thought it, we would attract mostly kind of the, the spiritual seeker or the wisdom seeker crowd, you know, people focused on, you know, mind, body and, and, and health. But it's, we've had, you know, business executives, we had, uh, you know, folks in their 20s, folks in their 70s. It's just been an, an, an incredible learning experience. And what you know, the, the one thing that, uh, that surprised us is we thought people wanted more like knowledge. And what people wanted a lot more was sharing. They, they wanted to hear from other people. And, and that really helped us change the course over time to add more opportunities for sharing because it's that sense of community that people care about so much. You know, they want to hear, you know, some great teaching from such and such tradition. And that's great. But on balance, when we said, what should we do more of? What should we do less of? It was uh, more of sharing, more community, more opportunities to interact, you know, with their peers and, and, uh, and ask questions, more time in the program to just interact. And, and we were concerned about that, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's working out. But that was one of the surprises. So what, what are the, um, you know, family members or partners or the people that go through the program say once they've gone through it? Do they notice a big change in the person? Yeah, they know, you know, we, we're not, it's not kind of a get rich quick scheme, right? It's not, it's not a heavy duty emotional weekend where you come out super jazzed and excited and jumping up and down. Uh, we're not going for that. We're, we're going for more, you know, the wisdom approach, which is what's really going on underneath without so much flashiness and so much display of, uh, of wisdom. One big wisdom skill we teach is humility. And uh, the response from families has, has really been great. The other thing that we heard, we actually have a couple of testimonials of people that, that said uh, what the impact has been in their business. We have a person who, who is, uh, basically does like not divorce mediation, but you know, mediation with couples who are about to divorce. Uh, and she said her business has gone through the roof because of the approach uh, that, you know, that she's changed her approach uh, with the business. And again, it's the skills of listening and, and the skills of empathy of really not just meeting a couple who is, you know, pre-divorce and, and, and just kind of talking them through it, but more having empathy for the one and the other and the family and not being afraid to wear your heart on your sleeve, uh, which is, you know, partly empathy, empathy and partly courage. So we've had that kind of feedback from family and, and, and clients of people that have gone through the program. Yeah, that's very good. Um, any particular stories, you know, without giving away the person's identity that really, um, I don't know, stuck with you or surprised you? Yeah, um, a couple of, uh, 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 two classes ago, we had a discussion, somehow the discussion veered into ancestors. And uh, we had some real breakthrough moments with people in, in a way connecting with their ancestry, not in, in, in some kind of a psychic way or anything like that, but just really just spending some time and going through some exercises and asking themselves, like, you know, where do I come from? And, you know, what, what's my actual ancestry and what, what's my cultural background? Uh, today we're taught that, you know, everything that's old is useless and, and the only thing that matters is the brand new gadget and the brand new widget and the brand new insight and the brand new study. Uh, and just having people look back, uh, we, we had uh, one person in particular who was just blown away when, when she just spent a little time. We had an exercise that was about a half an hour and it was kind of an introspection and, and, and looking back. 
And she just felt so grounded, like she is a continuation of something rather than, you know, some, something, you know, floating and bobbing around in the middle of the ocean, untethered uh, to anything. So th those kinds of stories we love to hear. And of course, you know, stories where people connect, right? Those are my favorite, where, where we love the stories when somebody, you know, after a weekend will call somebody that they've been having trouble with. But uh, one of my favorite ones was when the person was in class, they were debating whether to call the person, you know, that they had a conflict with. And instead, that person called them. And, and we thought, wow, okay, that's interesting. You know, I wonder since we placed, you know, so much energy and time and, and loving into, into that discussion, it was, it was shocking to know that they received an inbound call out of the blue. Oh, okay. So people called to what apologize for past behavior, let's say. Past behavior, yeah, that's right. And the person who was in our class was kind of preparing to do it. And she was going to do it, you know, I don't know, next week or this week or sometime. And while we were doing the classes, they got a call in from, from the person they were prepping to approach. And, you know, kind of they made peace, uh, which was just a beautiful thing. And, you know, I yeah. always have to wonder, is there, you know, as a scientist, it's hard for me to see the invisible links. I want, I want proof and publish clinical trials. But the spiritual part of me definitely thinks that it's, you know, that, that wasn't an accident. So what are some of the, uh, I don't know, the most difficult virtues from the ancient world for people to cultivate? Sure. Uh, it's really not so much about the difficult virtue as it is about knowing how to do it in the right amount. So, you know, courage taken to an extreme is recklessness, right? And empathy taken to an extreme, you, you become a martyr, right? Uh, you just become, a, you know, people start running all over you because you just love everybody and people quickly figure out they can get anything from you they, they want and they don't need to give you anything back. So uh, the one that's extolled in ancient wisdoms the most is, is the virtue of balance. And that's the one that's the, that's the hardest to do. Uh, and it's hard to do in, in, you know, in several different ways. One is to figure out, you know, which skill do I use right now? And then how much do I use it? And when do I stop? I'm sure you've been in conversations where somebody was, you know, giving you good advice and then it just went on and it just kind of turned the opposite. Or you were giving somebody advice and you were making progress. And then you said the 11th thing that just kind of erased everything you just said prior to that. You just deleted your own progress. So yeah, you're really, like over, over sell something and you tell the person maybe too many times like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, that's exactly it. It's the balance. Uh, and there, there is this myth that you have to be, you know, uh, an old person with a lot of life experience and your life has to be, dif life has had to have been difficult and you learn these wisdoms. Absolutely, there's no question. If you've been around for a large number of years and you've had a difficult life, you've probably learned more than, the, you know, than, than your uh, you know, average person. But that doesn't mean that the average person doesn't have access uh, to that wisdom without necessarily having to pay all those prices, right? Uh, this is what the great teachers teach us is, you know, here, learn this. And how do you learn to trust uh, in, in yourself? You know, you don't have to put your hand on a stove 10 times to learn that the stove is hot if you learn the first time around that but you can also learn by somebody telling you don't do that so it's it's about developing uh developing that skill to learn and listening for the feedback and just kind of being in this process rather than saying look here i am i'm done i'm fully baked i am who i am uh to always keep that window open and say what's there for me to learn here even in this conflict even in this difficult situation even with this war that's going on or these protests or the covid what can i learn here from from you know people who love masks and people who hate masks what, what are they really saying? What's really underneath that? Not to take any position, but is there something for me here to learn? Uh, and usually there is. Mm, okay. Well, very good. Well, Avir, how do people find out about your program? Where can they go to learn more and to get started? It's very simple. Uh, just go to upend.com, U-P-E-N-D.com, uh, -E like the word upend. Up. The idea is to upend you know, the, the patterns we've fallen into, uh, into our lives. So you go to upend.com, and there you can see the teachers and the classes. Uh, that we have and, uh, and the sharing. We have a blog and talk about uh, these things. It's a, it's a useful resource uh, for people to visit. Okay. Well, very good, Elvir. Uh, thank you so much for coming and, uh, you know, providing this useful framework to help people overcome, I guess, the, the friction in their lives, you know, and make their lives more peaceful and happy. So. That's it. It's about the regular people like me and you making their regular daily lives uh, fun, interesting, enjoyable, uh, even if, you know, whether it's you know, hard times come or easy times come or good times come that, that, you know, we all stick with each other. We love each other. We figure out how to get this, get through this together. And, uh, and we have a blueprint and we can follow it. 
Yeah, again, so I'll be here. thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate the time with you. Richard, thank you very much. Uh, most importantly, thank you for your really great questions. You made this very easy for me. And, you know, we haven't rehearsed, so I was, I was really happy that you, you laid out the questions in a very thoughtful and, and wise manner, if I may say so. Oh, yeah, no problem, Elvira. Thank you. Do you struggle with concentration? Have you ever thought of your brain health long term? Bomar Nutrition is revolutionizing the nootropic and cognitive health industry with sharp nootropic powder and patent-pending bright daily capsules, powered by NeuroBloom. If you struggle with focusing, think of Sharp as brain food that supports concentration. Sharp works with your natural brain chemistry to provide a heightened sense of well-being that can delay cognitive decline and also increase mood. Bomar Sharp tastes amazing and comes in many different flavors, available in caffeinated and non-caffeinated versions. While Sharp is a short-term aid in cognitive health, think of Bright Daily Capsules as a way to improve overall brain health and prevent cognitive decline long-term. As we age, so does our brain. Supplementing with Bright has the potential to delay this aging process and helps your brain function optimally. Stay ahead of the curve and order yours today at bomarnutrition.com and save $5 off with code GENIUS5. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.